squirrels. It's only 5.58. And it's time to read. If I don't fall asleep, you'd think it's earlier in the day. And, of course, I forgot to bring my drink in here. I'm always out, you know, when I decide to read, already sitting in here doing my thing. Just knit or crochet. And I'll say, I need to read. So I forget my drink. Chapter 4. If practice makes perfect, then I should be approaching near flawlessness. <laughs> I've made more trips to the Birch County Regional Medical Facility during my short time in Pincherry Harbor than all my previous hospital visits put together. In fact, I might even recognize the nurse at the front desk as I approach to get Silas's room number. I remember who's waiting for me at the diner. Excuse me, I'll be right back. I nod and smile at the nurse as I dart toward the nearest pot planted, potted plant filled alcove. Fishing my phone out of my pocket of my coat, I immediately call the sheriff's station and ask them to patch me through to my breakfast date. Don't worry, I actually used a professional tone and said Sheriff Harper and everything. Hey, Eric, I'm so sorry. I must have been in shock this morning. No, no, I didn't forget. I'm at the hospital. My, I mean, I just thought I should check on Silas. Can we reschedule our date for lunch? Sure. Um, all right. Understood. Let me give you the short version of Eric's side of that conversation. It's fine. He doesn't have time for lunch, and it wasn't a date. I obtained the necessary information regarding the room number for Silas, but when the nurse says he's in the sixth floor psych ward, even I know that's cause for concern. I step off the elevator and hastily make my way to room 607. I stop abruptly in the doorway, the man fighting against his restraints. No, it went away. No. Loading recommendations. Who asked for recommendations? Hang on. Hopefully I'll get back to where I was. Whatever, right. Come on, take me back to where I want to be. All right. Uh, the man fighting against his restraints in that hospital bed bears no resemblance to the calm, elderly, sedate Silas Willoughby. Rushing into the room, I gasp at his normally milky blue eyes which are now a deep shade of charcoal not to mention the rivulets of sweat streaming down his temples silas silas what's wrong how could i help you i'm sorry miss he won't be able to respond had to give him a high dosage of sed sedatives when the paramedics brought him in he was raving wildly about how cold he was he kept saying he was freezing but you can clearly see he's overheated Upon arrival, his temperature was 101.3, and it continues to climb. If the medication doesn't take effect soon, we'll be forced to take more drastic measures. I need to be alone with him, no communicate. To Wait a minute. I need to be alone with him to communicate with him somehow. Maybe physically or something else, psychically. Mm-hmm. But first, I have to get rid of this doctor. I shake my head in disbelief. Understood. I'll just sit here with him and call the nurse if there's any change in his condition. The doctor finally exits, and I sit back to survey the man in the hospital bed. I glance down at my mood ring, but the cloudy black swirls whirling inside the co 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 I can't say it offer no clue as to how I can help. There has to be something I can do. This morning, he asked me not to grasp his left hand and push, and push the cold into him. 
Maybe if I can reverse the process somehow, I can reverse the effects of whatever he did to quench the blaze. I take his right hand in mine, close my eyes, and try to visualize pulling the heat out of his body within moments. I feel searing heat in my hands. I breathe deeply and try to pull more. The flames are licking up my arms and my focus wavers. I force myself to concentrate. But the heat overwhelms me and I collapse backward into my chair. When I open my eyes, Silas Willoughby is resting comfortably on two freshly fluffed pillows. His skin has returned to its normal pale liver-spotted hue. Looks like me. And the perspiration previously drenching his face is gone. It would probably be probably be best if I slip out quietly and let him continue to sleep. I lean forward to get out of the chair and my legs collapse beneath me. The chair slides violently across the, the linoleum and crashes into the pulse ox monitor, setting off some kind of alarm. A nurse hurries into the room. Miss, are you all right? Did you faint? I push myself up on all fours and open my mouth to respond. She'll be fine, ma'am. She's blessed with a natural lack of coordination. The nurse shakes her head and leaves us. I turn just in time to see Silas enjoying a chuckle at my expense. Silas, you're all right. It appears your visit was most auspicious. You saved Graham's. Tears well up in my eyes as I struggle to haul myself back up and pull the chair next to the bed. May I inquire as to how you managed to assist me? I have no idea, Silas. I don't even know what was wrong with you. I just, the doctor said when they brought you in, you kept saying you were so cold. But when I looked at you, it seemed like you were burning up. I thought maybe it had something to do with all the energy stuff from this morning. So I tried to reverse the process, a practical approach, and you were successful. He steeples his fingers and bounces his soft chin on the tips of his index fingers. I'm not sure if it could be called a success. Whatever I did pulled some of the heat from you into me, and then I must have passed out. The art of transmutation is a delicate balance, Ms. I truly am in your debt. I grip the rail on the side of his bed and lean toward him. Lean toward him. What are you saying right now? If I hadn't come to the hospital, if I hadn't known what to do, are you saying that saving the bookshop could have killed you? He cas casually smooths his gray mustache with his thumb and forefinger. We will all pass beyond the veil one day, while I do not imply that I will welcome that transference. I know that this, that I know this, my life on this side of the veil has been enriched by knowing you. Hot tears spring to my eyes, and in spite of his harumph, I throw my arms around him and hug him tightly. Thank you. Releasing him, I stand next to his bed. I don't know what I'd do without you either, Silas. Now, I better get back to the bookshop and let Grams know that you're all right and that I need to figure, figure out some amazingly unforgettable way to apologize to Eric for standing him up at breakfast. Silas nods. I've always found pastry to be a delicious and heartfelt apology. I flash my eyebrows. Hmm, I've got just the thing. My winter driving skills have improved considerably during my first season of true snowfall in almost Canada. And as I pack my Jeep beside the, beside the bookstore, I can't, sta can't stop from enjoying a miniature seated happy dance. Who would have thought that this aimless orphan would one day reunite with the father she never knew and live with the ghost of the world's most wonderful grandmother? It's certainly not me. As I wandered from one unfulfilling barista job to another, crisscrossing the state of Arizona from Tombstone to Sedona, I had given up on ha happily ever afters. 
But now every day I wake up to a town that is genuinely, genuinely coming to feel like my home. And I get to hang out with my amazing grandmother. Plus, I'm finally getting to know my father. As a child, I dreamed he would come back to my mother and me. I've since learned that the mom, that my mom never wanted a relationship with my dad. They just had a fling, but she wanted me. And until a commuter train struck her car and stole her away from me, the two of us were fairly, were fairly happy together. And y'all, I'm going to have to stop there. I am dry as a bone. Oh, I'm almost done. This is a very short chapter. One more paragraph. I assure you that over six years in the foster care system was not a path I would have chosen. But ultimately, it brought me to my father and gave me the chance to build a relationship with him on my own terms. Two paragraphs. Another squad car passes through the barricade on First Avenue and brings back images of my sleepless night and narrow escape. Personal reflection time is over. I need to update Graham, Swiggy, and Piwacket. And after that, I better hustle on down to the... some that, uh, pastry place. On 3rd Avenue and find a way to both apologize and bribe Eric because you and I both know I'm going to get to the bottom of why there was a body in that building. And that's all of chapter 4. So, sorry for the short one, but got to remember to bring my drink in here. Have a lovely day. Hope to see you tomorrow. Give away tomorrow. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.